Ak by na to nakoniec môže skúsiť, že či to ide dobre. Ako zvuk, keby... Pretože keď budem púšťať nejaké video, tak to uvidíš z tej kamery? Video uvidíme hentak. Dobre. Stačí to, hej? Raz, dva, raz, dva. Halo, 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 halo. Svieti to červeno, nie je to... To je dobré? Zelená je dobrá, nie? Raz, dva, raz, dva, raz, dva, počuješ ma? Počuješ ma dobre? Som tu dneska na vašej akcii. Loud and clear, jo. Hodím ho tam, hodím. Ja to... Ešte, t- tento slajd nevadí? Vadí? Tento. Čakaj, no. Mhm. No, môžem to hodiť, co ja môžem. Čakaj. A to môžem dať, ako, aby to bolo neutrálne. No, no. Aby to nezabudlo. Chvíľku. Tak sa s tým nehraje. Toto? Dobre. Ale je to rozjebané. Môžeš teda výmer, to je jedno. Nechaj sa s tým. Daj to naspäť. A iba tam dajš z Slovensko. To sa tým nevyšla. Zapni tam DevOps, DevOps, veľký fonto, vieš? Takže DevOps. To je DevOps, to je DevOps, klasika, a Slovensko. To je to 8 edition. A to je prvého 8 edition a daj tam 31.01. Ešte 3, 1, 0, 1. So, guys, uh, hi, everybody. Oh, is someone speaking English for all of us? For check. So, because intent is to, because we are already streamed, we are live streaming now. So, uh, um. so uh, I would like to welcome everybody online and also. So this is, uh, I think, eighth edition of uh, DevOps Slovensko meetup. I found it, I was just checking, it was founded, I founded it uh, two years ago, or one and a half, June 2017. So this is becoming quite successful. I mean, last session delivered by guys from Feratum was the best, I would say. So... Uh, Let's let's look, look. I'm looking forward for today, so let's 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 go for it. Uh, so, based on program, you saw it online. We have the first part, which is uh, also close to my heart, <laughs> but now it will be delivered by a, a guy from VMware, Tomasz Michaelis, which will be pivotal container service Kubernetes stuff. 
Uh, and then there will be second part delivered by Peter Dodok. Also guy last time or last time delivered or the, yeah, uh, it was before last time when you delivered your part session or maybe you were two or three past. So, and you, you will deliver GitLab automation on uh, top of the cloud PKS Kubernetes, some microservice based application. Uh, Tomas, he will, he will talk about uh, architecture of Kubernetes running on uh, enterprise environment, primarily on VMware, but not only on VMware. So AWS, Azure, or Google. Uh, and then, of course, second part, which is uh, which are guys uh, from Feratum. Yeah, so they are the best in in all the DevOps. As far as I know, they are one of the best here in Slovakia. So uh, I'm looking forward personally for 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 that part. So let's go for it. It should be until seven or half past seven, I think. Let's let's see how it will work. Uh, based on your interest feedback, maybe we will continue even more longer. So, thank you. So it's gonna be in English, yeah? Yes. Okay. Given the discussion with the uh, audience. Maybe discussion. If there will be usually man to switch, maybe we, we can interrupt online session or whatever. Maybe we can switch to Slovak and then another session in English. We'll, we'll see. Okay. Uh, so good good afternoon to everyone. My name is Tomasz Michal. I'm working for VMware, and today I'm going to uh, look at the PKS, which is joint product between us and Pivotal. So yes, those two are commercial companies, but we are in software development. Uh, VMware seems to be uh, the third largest uh, software company in the world. Pivotal is pretty active in, in uh, cloud found in uh, cloud native foundation as well as uh, in other development areas. So I'll try to give you our view of uh, container-ready infrastructure. <laughs> My speech is going to be focused on PKS, which is uh, architecture containing several open source projects and several uh, homegrown, home, homegrown projects, which we are trying to bundle together as one solution. So the brief history, you know, uh, when the container started with namespaces in uh, Linux kernel, the first user of that was uh, Google. Then Docker came out with uh, like a packaged solution where we are able to run the uh, containers on nearly any operating system. After that, uh, Kubernetes were released from uh, um, Google and become de facto mainstream for uh, container orchestration. And you can see nowadays solutions coming up from uh, different uh, vendors. So uh, you see PKS is one of the solutions, which gives you ability to maintain and orchestrate uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters in, in your environment. So PKS stands for Pivotal Container Service. The K in the middle is uh, not for containers because we write containers with C, so K is for Kubernetes. And actually the whole solution has several uh, components in it. So it's a PKS control plane, which is proprietary. Bosch is open source project. You, you probably know Bosch uh, from uh, open source uh, community. The, uh, another part which is commercial, it's NS60 and Harbor and uh, other are uh, again open source projects. So this is basically the architecture where the blue boxes become uh, a part of the PKS. The green bo boxes are usually components which sits around the solution air and are fully integrated with uh, uh, PKS uh, uh, solution. You can usually build the PKS on top of nearly any infrastructure you have either on-prem or uh, hosted outside in the public cloud. So uh, Bosch is currently delivered in uh, an option that you are able to connect to AVS, uh, Google Container Platform, Azure. So new version supports also Azure and any type of uh, uh, VMware cloud-based uh, uh, solution or private, uh, let's say, infrastructure. And all that is uh, connected to the Bosch as a simple 
infrastructure as a service. And Bosch, together with Pivotal Container Service, is able to provision a Kubernetes cluster at any place of uh, those uh, uh, infrastructures. Uh, why we build this solution? Uh, why uh, we feel it's uh, necessary? The, the first demand which we got from enterprises is uh, we need to follow up the organization structure. So we still have developers and people who take care about the infrastructure, so operation team. And we need to bring a solution which will uh, be beneficial for both. Yeah? The traditional request for a huge uh, virtual machine positioned or, or connected somewhere in data center clearly indicates the interest uh, for the uh, containers. But at the end, uh, uh, developers cannot work without the operation team and without the old brownfield infrastructure because it is already in the place and sometimes very useful data are sitting in this infrastructure. So uh, with PKS, you can clearly uh, build from infrastructure people, uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster and uh, environment which is fully uh, consumed by the uh, developers. If you look on the first component of the solution, it's PKS control plane and the Bosch. Uh, those two components are responsible primarily for building a Kubernetes cluster itself. So Bosch is uh, sitting um, in the infrastructure and it has a Bosch deployment manifest together with stem cell and all the data which are regularly updated by Pivotal itself. Bosch is kind of a repository for the cluster initial installation. Whenever you need uh, an extra cluster or you need to do upgrade or whatever, the Bosch is your path to do a particular. Uh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we have small disruption. Thanks. So this is the source of uh, the cluster build. The cluster is always fully redundant. Uh, uh, the, the, the way how we build the masters uh, is pretty uh, clear. So we have three masters with uh, uh, dedicated uh, HCD and number of workers. All that is finally presented in the infra infrastructure in form, of, in form of virtual machines. And Bosch is capable to maintain and build the cluster on top of virtualized uh, infrastructure. If you plan to use uh, containers on bare metal or on physical servers, uh, you have to install it by yourself by hand. Uh, Bosch cannot help you in, in that uh, particular case. Yes? Uh, OK. Let me try to do it. Something French. Uh, no. Ah, okay. I'm all good. Uh, uh, uh. Oh. Yeah. So here is an example. Uh, similar as the developer is using kubectl to provision um, uh, microservices and install them across the workers, the PKS control plane has similar interface, it's called uh, PKS uh, uh, CLI. And through this CLI, you are able to create a cluster to ask and change the size of the cluster. So in this uh, small example, I go and I create Coop ODB, small cluster, and this is the name of the cluster. I generate the service key for authentication and changing the context. And I can get all the pods which I have in my uh, cluster. Bosch together with uh, uh, PKS control plane is not responsible only for creating initial uh, cluster installation. It is also responsible for self-healing uh, Kubernetes cluster itself. So workers are uh, fully covered by Kubernetes cluster, but Kubernetes cluster itself has no um, uh, agents. Uh, if one node fails, you need to do manual step to uh, make your cluster working up and running. So it can deliver manual repair. There is both agent running inside the host where we are running the 
Kubernetes cluster, and this agent periodically check the life of the Kubernetes cluster nodes. Whenever node fails, it will automatically respin a new uh, master node and create and join him to remaining members uh, to establish relationship and start the synchronization on etcd, etcd configuration. Also, the scale scaling of uh, running cluster is something which is present inside the, uh, the PKS control plane. Whenever you need to extend uh, your worker capacity, you just go and you resize your running cluster which is uh, very convenient for the uh, network oper or for the operation of uh, such infrastructure. Um, patch management is driven also from PKS. So PKS is, res is responsible for Kubernetes upgrades. You are not doing the upgrades manually. It's all fully automatic through CLI. So whenever there is a new version of Kubernetes, you just go and commit upgrade or downgrade. So you can do upgrades, downgrades. And the control plane together with Bosch is responsible that all clusters which you have indicated are being uh, upgraded to the version which you want to have uh, in place. This process is fully automatic with no disruption. Yeah, So it should be done the way that we will start to upgrade the first node, second node, third node, and do all that simultaneously without any disruption. You will see in the later uh, part, we can do also backup of the Kubernetes cluster itself. So if you have any production sensitive cluster, which is like super uh, important, and the application which is running on him is usually business critical, you can do backup of etcd masters and uh, recover your cluster from standard backup you're using for uh, normal other workloads. We have a feedback from a guy who did the installation here in the check. So um, he was able to do full recovery after complete failure of, uh, of the infrastructure, including hosts, within one hour. So within one hour, he was able to bring everything up and running, uh, hypervisors, virtualization, Bosch, PKS, together with uh, Kubernetes nodes and uh, workers running uh, uh, microservices. Uh, he's also responsible for uh, logging and separated performance monitoring. So whenever you need to do and filter logs per project, per uh, team, which is working on particular cluster, you have uh, a concept of uh, unique names and UIDs. And those IDs you are able to filter not only inside the logs, but also <clears throat> inside the in, in network troubleshooting and some other tools which allows you to bring uh, uh, and, and, and do fast operation on the platform. With um, vSphere, uh, PKS is capable to reflect uh, your infrastructure. So uh, you have, and you know the concept of availability zones in traditional cloud providers like Amazon, Azure, etc. And uh, same concept applied to PKS. So during the PKS installation, you are able to map availability zones inside the PKS into resource pools or clusters. So imagine if you have three clusters in your infrastructure, you can create uh, three independent availability zones. And during the uh, Kubernetes cluster creation, you may ask where this cluster should be uh, created. You can also create availability zones from resource pools. And this is the way how you divide the resources between your uh, developers. So if you have less important projects and you want to allocate just 10% of the capacity, you go, you create a resource pool and you map the resource pool to availability zone. And then you let to create the, the cluster on top of uh, the resource pool. As an uh, addition to the PKS uh, API and CLI. So PKS has not only CLI, it has also API. And this API is leveraged or used by uh, your automation, for instance. So if you have OpenStack and you use some portal or any other uh, automation in your company, you can, you can create a task, create your own Kubernetes cluster and put it in uh, upstream uh, uh, cloud management portal. 
uh, accessing the API and CLI is fully uh, controlled by authentication, and we can enable uh, integration with Active Directory and LDAP. So you know exactly who is the owner of individual uh, clusters. So it's very easy, or it's easier to track uh, inside huge company who does what. Inside the kubectl, we are not able to create uh, uh, LDAP authentication. So developers are coming directly to the Kubernetes cluster. However, you have namespaces which are uh, definitely useful to separate uh, teams and. Uh, uh, the other uh, users of the technology. Um, next part, which is not open source project, but it's really based on open source, uh, or it, it is fully open source project, but the, the latest version is also always with PKS. And it's really popular technology also with other um, Kubernetes installation is Harbor. Harbor is image repository for your um, cloud native application stack. This image repository is perfectly fine to run on-prem, and it has got several security features. So uh, you can use uh, Claire for uh, image scanning. So all images which are stored on uh, this image repository are scanned against the known, well-known vulnerabilities. There are three levels of warnings, alert, uh, notice, and this scanning is done constantly on the uh, repository. If there is any uh, problem with the image, CVE found, uh, the image is blocked from uh, the developers to be used. And you can uh, enable it after the security hole is fixed. After that, the patch is published and it's published also to your workers. So you don't need to care about the uh, patching and uh, rolling out the new versions. The important part of the harbor is uh, also content trust image signing. So whenever you have um, a new stem cell or you want to sign uh, images which are used by the developers, you can use your internal uh, certification authority to sign all the images. Not signed image means you cannot use it. And this is the way how we ensure that there is no image inside your infrastructure which was not delivered from this uh, certified uh, app store or image repository. Harbor allows you as well to create uh, three kind of uh, roles, guest, developer, and admin. Guest is capable to do just Docker pull, and you can even specify which versions he is able to pull from the image repository. Docker push and pull is done by developers, and you can assign uh, uh, by assigning the roles to the users who has these rights. And the last one is admin. Admin is uh, open to do anything inside the uh, harbor. Uh, if you have any pipeline uh, in your infrastructure, either using Jenkins or uh, Bamboo or anything else, you may. Uh, create several repositories. So test repository, production repository, staging repository. And images are uh, chained across those repositories based on your requirements. This image chaining can be fully automated from CI CD pipeline. And it can give you ability to fully uh, automize the image uh, propagation inside individual uh, registries. The last part, non-commercial, is NSX, but it's part of the bundle. Uh, and it solves uh, several networking uh, problems for uh, your infrastructure. So usually, uh, most of the customers are deploying containers the following way. You have two nodes. Those nodes are connected to single flat uh, layer two network. And inside those nodes, uh, you create the tenants, namespaces. Those namespaces are really across the hosts. Uh, if you use the namespaces across the host, the microservice which is running on pod one is always translated or source knotted when it goes out to ask for some additional data or when he's talking to your uh, database running on physical machine, which is connected over the router and the firewall inside the infrastructure. The physical uh, 
physical workload like database or file store or whatever is always protected. So you need to go and ask your compliance team, okay, can you please allow me this IP address to talk to this database? Yes, it takes two weeks, three weeks. After two or three weeks, your Kubernetes cluster spin this microservice on another host. And because the IP here is different, the microservice become unknown to the physical firewall and it has no access to the database. So the solution what companies does recently is that they isolate microservices to particular hosts and they don't move them across the host and workers, which is obviously a good solution. Uh, however, on the other hand, you completely uh, uh, disallow uh, Coop uh, to do the self-healing, self-scaling for you. With uh, technologies like NSXT, you can go and do following operations. So every single namespace is dedicated logical switch and the dedicated logical router. This means that the logical switch is, a, is an overlay a connectivity which is visible to every single node which partic participate in the single in the same transport zone. Uh, in our case, we have two uh, namespaces and those namespaces are connected over the T1 router. This is the software component inside the host and T0 router, which is another software component, part of the, so part of the solution. Then the connection goes out to the physical firewall, to the database. So we support two modes. You can go no NOT mode. In no NOT mode, this IP address is fully routed out to the physical firewall. However, you can inherit the microservice name and bind it together with IP and fix the policy on uh, this interface, on this interface, and eventually also on the physical firewall. So we have cooperation with several physical firewall vendors and the microservice source address is propagated to their rules. This is the first option. Second option is to build a NAT on um, last component, which is T0. And with this as NAT, it really doesn't matter where the microservice is running. As long as it is going out over the T0, the source address is always translated to one particular dedicated IP. And this one particular dedicated IP is allowed by the data center firewall for you. So instead of uh, changing constantly the security rules, you can stay compliant and run and use even one IP address, which was allowed in the past for different service and somehow uh, let it work. But PKS is not close to the NSX. It doesn't mean if you if you like PKS, you, you, have, to use, uh, NS, uh, you have to use NSX. PKS supports both uh, NSX and Flannel. So when you install PKS, the question is, do you want to use NSX or Flannel. If you do Flannel, it will build for you this part only. You need to go then later and add Calico for IP tables and security, NGI, NGX for HA proxy and load balancing and other components to build full uh, network pipeline. With NSXT, you receive all the functionalities inside. So we have layer two, layer three, uh, switching routing, you have layer four and layer seven security, you have load balancing, and you have amazing tools to do uh, troubleshooting. So if you need to check the path from container to container or path from container to VM or even to physical server, you are able to use very powerful tools to do the job for you. The communication from Kubernetes master, so it's not PKS talking to NSX, the real Kubernetes cluster is talking through NCP interface uh, down to the NSX manager. Uh, this is fully NCP compliant. Uh, we support, I believe, NCP 2.2 and 2.3 versions. And you can use nearly any Kubernetes cluster to connect to the NSX. Uh, so you can build your own open source. You can use OpenShift and configure it to use uh, uh, SDN underneath. When you go and you run kubectl create namespace 4, it will create for you logical switch, T1 router, connect T1 router to T0 router, and connect your microservices. All that 
is propagating the routes down to the T0 and T0 can talk to our infrastructure with the static or BGP routing. So we can establish the peering here. So whole concept is completely dynamic. When you create the new service, it will appear and your physical infrastructure is completely aware where this namespace is based. When you run NGIX full inside, it will create microservice, apply the security policy, and your operation team has visibility to the traffic as well as to the security policy created by Kubernetes. Yeah. So when we uh, do the network address tra translation, we can also use per uh, pod and application group translation. So we can select a group of application and use different source NAT IP for those microservices uh, for access out to the database server. So this is a diagram of the visibility. So this is not PKS interface, it's not uh, Kubernetes interface, this is NSX interface, which is usually in control of the operation team. And here you have the firewall rules. So every single firewall rule created by Kubernetes is displayed as source, destination, port, and uh, where it is installed. And also we have the visibility to the traffic. So we have the source uh, microservice and the destination microservice. And you see full path. You see also services applied across the path. You can uh, download uh, routing tables, ARPs, etc. From the policy perspective, whenever you have uh, application description and you are asking for policy, uh, ingress from IP block port protocol TCP, it will create a dedicated section in the rule base. The section will receive an ID from your uh, namespace. So you, you can easily filter and find out which rules are uh, relevant to your workload. And it will allow your administrators and operators to add an extra section which is above all the Kubernetes sections. And this is the way how we deal with the problem of uh, policy governance. So this is the section which is fully dedicated to your app. And above the section, there is a policy which is controlled by the security team. And with this construct, it can never happen that you will enable something which is disabled by, uh, by the guys from the operation team. So whole architecture looks like uh, the following. You have T1 routers, which are uh, dedicated for namespaces. They are connected to T0. And T0 relies connectivity outside to the internet, uh, to VLAN-based uh, workloads, physical uh, physical devices, as well as to VLAN uh, connected uh, virtual machines, which may sit in uh, another another place. NS60 is fully uh, uh, compatible with uh, vSphere and with the KVM, so we can run your virtualization on KVM. However, uh, PKS does not know how to handle uh, KVM. It can handle OpenStack, so there might be a way that you build the OpenStack, you add NSX, you put KVM, and then you will convince PKS to use OpenStack as your infrastructure as a service. But uh, there is no way how to manage uh, KVM. Or there is a way how to manage KVM, but there is no product which PKS support to go directly to the KVMs. Load balancing is also part of the NSX service uh, portfolio. So for the east-west load balancing and as well for north-south load balancing, uh, the, the service is used. And it's very important because nowadays we are talking about service mesh. Service mesh is a new way how to connect microservices together. So it's fully proxy-based, fully authenticated by, by certificates. And this is the crucial part of uh, service mesh, which we have announced recently. Uh, so this part and this service will be used for realizing this uh, connectivity. Load balancing service is present in every T1 and T0 instance, and you can even use it for uh, the other way around. So you can use it to, to balance your physical workloads for your containers. And last thing, uh, the NSX is uh, very comprehensive from endpoints perspective. So we can add into the NSX domain also the physical uh, servers. So for those who decided for uh, containers on bare metal, so if you are running uh, uh, 
Linux directly on the physical machines and you propagate containers to, to this type of infrastructure, you can still use NSX because NSX nowadays put, uh, supports uh, bare metal servers with kind of agent and open vSwitch uh, construct. Uh, definitely this setup will be not able to, to be connected to PKS, okay? So that was the parts which are which are uh, belong to PKS. Uh, if you look down to the vSAN or vSphere infrastructure, we talk about the storage mapping to your workloads. So persistent storage is something which is demanding for uh, seven out of 10 uh, applications from microservices. You may think about the Redis database, Elasticsearch is also a, a solution which sometimes demand um, uh, persistent storage. So the way how we deal with this is that we can provide for uh, Kubernetes cluster storage classes and those storage classes are directly mapped to, have, to VMDK files uh, on the uh, data store. The data store may be uh, vSAN data store or standard data store uh, accessed uh, from your uh, storage array. This data store is ported back and uh, published as a uh, Kubernetes volume inside the uh, microservice. Whenever the microservice dies or is respinned on another node, you have access to the same volume uh, uh, and it is mounted as a standard volume inside the microservice. So with vSAN uh, storage policy, you can define on top of single data store, you have one data store for all cluster members, several uh, classes of your storage. So instead of doing, doing it upside down, so instead of buying different type of storages, you have a branch of disks, you connect all of them to the single data store and with uh, storage policy, you define those classes and you can offer those classes to your uh, microservices uh, owners and they can consume them based on the requirements. So this is example, refactoring of web logic. If you need to run web logic, there are two type of files inside the uh, system, logs and XML uh, uh, templates. Those XML templates, they don't need, uh, it's usually read only access, so they run on uh, uh, lower class than the logs. Logs are very important. They need uh, quick uh, I.O. So this is uh, the way that you will map them on the higher class with guaranteed uh, IOPS, for instance. So this from infrastructure perspective and uh, from monitoring perspective, there is a broad range of uh, ways how to monitor it. Anyone knows Bayfront? Anyone heard about the Bayfront? No, unfortunately. So log consolidation, we fully support things like syslogng, uh, Splunk, or you can use Virilize log insight, uh, Virilize operation and automation, I talk about those. And the Bayfront is uh, important uh, addition to the integra integrated solution. So Wavefront is fully SaaS-based offering. You have ability over the proxy to send all important data into the Wavefront analytic engine. And uh, you have also pieces of code which you can add to your, it's very similar to the Google Analytics here. So you take piece of code and you can put it to the PHP, to Java, to Go, to whatever language on the planet. And those pieces, through proxy-like uh, connection will provide you with uh, exact timing, with, uh, uh, with the measurements and metrics, which are particularly, particularly important for certain solutions. So we have uh, nearly 1000 applications which are supported by Wavefront and those metrics are visible from uh, your uh, interface uh, this is not part of the PKS, it's a SaaS-based service, so you, you, you can free, freely use it and, and buy it for certain capacity. So you can set up the KPIs for your uh, infrastructure and alerts when those KPIs are not met. And here you can see very simple uh, configuration inside the PKS 
installation dialog you just add a url and that's it the monitoring monitoring is up and running you don't need to install anything so pks itself is here to bring you high availability for your kubernetes clusters and uh, build them whenever you need it to give you ability to scale the solution whenever the team demand more capacity to do health check and life cycle full life cycle management so whenever you need to delete the cluster because the project or team was uh, cancelled inside the company it's uh, very simple to track it and it will be deleted not only uh, from compute perspective, but you will delete also the network construct. Yeah, so the traditional headache, my internal firewall has 10,000 rules and I don't know which one I, I can delete, is solved by this uh, simple uh, uh, component. Kubernetes is uh, Google Container Engine certified. Uh, the uh, life cycle of uh, Kubernetes is so... Uh, frequent so you can have multiple versions throughout the year and you can use different version of pks to run uh, upper uh, version of kubernetes the delay between us and the uh, uh, gcp or gc uh, certified uh, kubernetes is uh, roughly something between four to six uh, weeks currently the uh, VMware participating also in uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. You may find some projects which are here. So it's Dispatch, Hatchaway, NSX, PKS, uh, Harbor is also uh, here on the list. And those are projects which are actively developed by uh, VMware. You will find as well some um, uh, pivotal project on, 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 on the space. Some, some news from PKS 1.2. This is not important for you, but we have integration with our automation, which is common for certain customers. Mapping to availability zones came out in 1.2. And uh, user access based on LDAP is also came out with 1.2. 1.3 has ability to do, uh, let's say, uh, creation of sync card or like your profile. And then you may send out the logs based on the uh, sync and based on the namespace uh, isolation. So inside your syslog engine and log inside engine, you have fully multi-tenant access uh, to the logs. Uh, the Kubernetes cluster is logged to uh, the logging component through different tenant. Um, we have uh, introduced in 1.3 also the backup. I talk about it. So we have dedicated command BBR deployment backup and restore. This is the way that there is a, a Jambox, Jambox host created, which has access to external data repository. It's usually uh, network mounted storage like NFS or iSCSI. And through uh, its CD BBR add on, you are able to run uh, a backup of your master Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this master co master configuration is stored and you have restore command so you can do backup and restore without uh, disruption. So it does not require any uh, um, stop or any service down during, during the backup. The sizing has been improved. So in the past you had like uh, eight, 10 classes of sizes for the cluster, which you were able to define inside the PKS. So we always define how much CPU, how much memory. And when you create the cluster, you cho choose this class. With a new one to three, you may extend. Uh, PKS create the cluster, minus N is four workers. Whenever you need to extend number of workers or uh, decrease number of workers, it's just PKS resize cluster minus N6, minus N5, and it will give you ability to scale your solution. Okay, so this is the initial part, and I have like two videos from real life uh, how, to use, uh, how to use PKS. I have also lab available, but the latency in, in the lab is currently uh, so high, 
and uh, every single command uh, we should wait like 20, 30 seconds, <laughs> which is not a really good thing for this set of events. So I have uh, videos which I may share with you uh, from the lab. Okay, so let me <clears throat> show it on for you. So this is the first one where I demonstrate. Oops. This little jumped into NSX Manager to see what was created. Can we mute it somehow? Yeah, some do lava. Cactus. Get it there. Study it. Uh huh. So we go uh, cube CTL uh, bar. So we created namespace bar. Namespace bar has a new uh, router. So it's T1 router, which is using, sorry for this one, uh, addressing and the name is auto-generated, but it has also tags associated with. We have logical switch created. The name is here, bar and new ID. <clears throat> and we have IP pool created for this. So those addresses are used for allocation to microservices uh, components. <clears throat> Here we have NSX policy. So this is the policy into the firewall. So we allow uh, NGIX to access database on port 80, kubectl apply demo policy. And this policy is deployed inside the firewall. So we have the, your section. You have a security group, which includes the service, uh, which includes the source and destination. And here is the TCP 80. <clears throat> Groups is fully dynamically created. So whenever you launch the microservice, so I'm starting NGIX, it will fulfill the group with an IP address. So it's fully automated process, yeah. When I check now the security group, it will contain the object. Trace flow is the way how we can trace the connectivity from one container to another, and it's based on a logical port. So I'll choose the logical port, which has the name uh, based on the service name. And this is dropped by the firewall because we did not allow TCP communication between those two. Now we're going to fix, and we will en enable uh, a demo policy. We will delete it and it will follow any any accept rule. If I do retrace, the communication is allowed. So you see uh, the path from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the load balancer inside the PKS. It's created in load balancing space. You see uh, the port and IP address. You will see uh, an application coffee YAML, T YAML, and those two are going to be load balanced differently. So we are running uh, uh, T coffee, and uh, uh, we have two instances of both. So I'll try to log into the one, I will get coffee, yeah. So the load balancing will run uh, inside the uh, NSX and will give you even URL uh, uh, parsing and triggering so we can, you can uh, switch uh, from one to another and do like context-based load balancing rules. Okay. <laughs> Okay.
Čo používate? Používate aj Helm na, na inštaláciu do Kubernetes, či máte iba cez Kubernetes to vám? Na mikroservisy deploymenty máme templatey, deployment specky, takže ťažké. A samotný klaster cez Ansible. Uh-huh. OK, toto je skôr tak uh, aplikačne postavené. Vlastne ja som tam využil Helm, Helm a Tajem, dvoj, dvojčku a neviem, do akej miery budú chcieť. Viac menej to je prezentácia alebo otázka. Kolega riešil Helm. Ja som ho tam používal chceli spraviť to, že developeri by nech vôbec nemuseli riešiť tie pojemné aspeky. Uh-huh. Že nech si len zadefinujú, že som ťa a mám takéto, takéto environment variable. V prípadne v takomto environmente chcem mať viac CPUčka. Uh-huh. A nič viac o tom nevedia. Sú to sa do nejakého templateu na tlačí. Uh-huh. To je, a to by sa už normálne robí o CPU. OK. Zatiaľ tak, no. Ale pokiaľ, no záleží. Sme jazvedaj. Strašne veľa toho, teraz rozrobeného a už neviem, kde skôr skočiť. Ono je to široká téma, dosť celý ten DevOps a hlavne okolo Kubernetes. My, čo sme robili pre Porsche a Daimler, tak to sú také, že to bolo dosť náročné celé zimplementovať. Teraz prechádzame na Jenkins, ešte stále prechádzame, ale stále sú to nejaké z mojich požiadavky. Uh-huh. na bambu. Uh-huh. A takto deploymenty v Jenkins sa vôbec neviem tak pekne vyriešiť, ako sú v bambu správne. Uh-huh. A akože z užívateľského hľadiska. Nie, že to má byť na dashboardu a release a uh-huh. strašne veľa custom kódu, kde sa to vypadlo. Ono, to, to je historické, Jenkins je dev nástroj pre developerov a developeri sú leniví, aby to malo pekný interfejs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Ako? V OpenShifte nie, ale ono je to podstavené na tom, že akýkoľvek Kubernetes cluster by to malo vedieť vyriešiť, hej, že v podstate OpenShift je Kubernetes, takže tam je dôležité, že na strane toho klastra je tam inštalovaný Tyler a má vlastne sekrety na to, aby si dotiahol nejaké imidže, ktoré chce inštalovať a vlastne všetko funguje už je to od, odskúšané, takže tie veci. Pokračujeme. Poprosím stíšiť a bude druhá časť, krátka časť. Peťo do dok, je s témou. Potom následne pôjdu vaši chváli, teda domáci. Peťo. OK. Uh, my name is Peter do dok. And... Uh, and... Uh, My goal is to present you uh, some DevOps pipeline in uh, Kubernetes with uh, Helm. Uh, the big question is, how many of you knows uh, GitLab CI tool? Okay, two, three, okay, four, okay, great. So uh, GitLab CI is uh, one commercial tool for pipelines. Uh, whole presentation is uh, Uh, taken from uh, developer perspective or application perspective. And I don't want to bother you with a uh, presentation or slides, so I will quickly run through the presentation. So uh, I'm from Exeta. Exeta is a German company, and we mainly focus on automotive uh, and bank uh, consulting. Uh, here is our portfolio. And for the, the goal of this presentation, I choose one of our uh, training application, which is uh, spending report. Uh, main thing is that this application is divided into uh, two parts. One part is a web application, and which is written in JavaScript uh, Angular. And second part is backend application, which is uh, fully microservices architecture. Uh, backend part is uh, using uh, Spring Cloud technologies. So I will run through this. This is how it looks like from a web perspective. And uh, this is what is, uh, what pipeline means to me or also to GitLab CI CD. It's di divided in CI and CD. CI is used for building and testing the application code, and CD is for deployment, review or dev environment, and uh, staging and production environment. It's general. Okay, goal of my presentation is show you how Uh, how we are building Docker images, where we are storing it, and uh, how CI and CD pipeline is uh, implemented, and also deployment with Helm uh, Tyler. Uh, who knows Helm and Tyler? Okay, uh, Tyler is a component which is uh, installed or should be installed in the Kubernetes cluster. 
uh, is responsible for installation and connection to the uh, to the cluster from uh, uh, client side. Uh, in client side or pipeline, there is a Helm component which is responsible to push uh, templates about the application into specific Kubernetes cluster. Uh, okay, for this presentation, I used the Kubernetes cluster which was deployed in uh, PKS, in the malware, and uh, was authorized and uh, Helm installed. I will show you uh, quick how, how it is done, how it's implemented, and uh, maybe it should be oriented in your question if any rises. Okay, so I will make it, is it clear? Okay. Or some hammer. Okay, okay. Uh, generally, most of, most of us knows this is the some uh, Java project. In Java project, there is a, a GitLab CI file, which is uh, from GitLab perspective, it's definition of pipeline. The good thing is that uh, whole stuff about pipeline is in one file. Uh, it, it's in uh, it's in the project, so it's versioned, and uh, devel developers can touch it. Can uh, uh, everybody who who can read the Git repository can see what's uh, happening on on pipeline. Uh, there is also dev vmware pks uh, uh, directory, which means it is uh, it is uh, templates which is written in Helm structure. And these templates are responsible for installation or description of installation. Uh, I can quick show you how GitLab CI file is implemented. A whole all, uh, pipeline is run in a Docker container, so you can uh, even specify your own container, which when you uh, need some specific requirements for, for uh, building, you can bring your own solution for it. Also, there is possible to uh, write some variables for pipeline and uh, make some folder caching for, for uh, performance reason. Uh, main point of uh, pipeline are stages. Stages are uh, phases of the pipeline, which means uh, build. There can be uh, unit testing uh, stage we have a release image and deployment dev. Uh, this is a demo application. We, we use it for training research, uh, training uh, uh, possibilities. So we can, uh, we don't have any stable environment for it. So that's why it is not here any other dev uh, or test environment. Uh, here is the standard Maven build, which is uh, run on uh, image Maven latest. It's a uh, standard uh, image. And uh, there is a release Docker image which is uh, responsible for building and pushing uh, uh, the image of the application into repository. You can use your own repository uh, or even GitLab has own repository too. Uh, the next stage is uh, deploy to VMware PKS cluster one, which is our, so our uh, purpose of this presentation. The stage is uh, de deploy to dev, deploy dev. And here is all commands which is uh, necessary to run this stage and deploy the application into cluster. Uh, one note to this, here is the special uh, Docker image we built for uh, for uh, this job. Uh, it's because VKE is, VKE is not a, a standard uh, uh, command line solution in 
any any image which is available so we need to bring our own uh, that's the reason why we created new image and uh, uh, with wiki wiki we uh, we authenticate our our pipeline to uh, cluster then we with uh, wiki cluster out setup we put this authentic authentication into kubectl command line and with helm we can uh, we, we can uh, in, initialize this authentication to be used with helm uh, this is the before script which is done before main script uh, is uh, run main script is helm upgrade install which means if the application is already in a cluster uh, so it will only upgrade the changes or if there is no such application there so it will uh, install new one for us in this in this uh, in this helm upgrade command uh, we can specify a lot of things uh, uh, main thing is we specify namespace because we can we need to use it in a separate namespace uh, for this this application and uh, we put uh, some some uh, some uh, variables into pipeline uh, i will show you where this uh, web name or web dot image <coughs> is uh, used uh, the main thing is image pool secret which is uh, uh, which is GitLab registry. This is the secret which needs to be placed on uh, Kubernetes side because Kubernetes needs to have rights or certificate or secret to download image from our repository. And all other things is application stuff. So we don't need to care about it now. Uh, we specify environment for this uh, deployment, which is Dev. And uh, we specify that this uh, action will be triggered by manual action. Uh, there is another, another uh, new release stage or new release job, which is not important now. And uh, what I want to show is the Helm definition. Helm definition or Helm, uh, Helm folder is uh, has a general structure which can be found on the internet and you can learn it uh, for yourself. But uh, there should be chart YML, which is uh, uh, main main descri description of the deployment. You can uh, you can name it, you can version it, and make some notes there or some other variables which you know what you know. Uh, the main thing is the folder templates where is placed all all uh, YML or description files for your Kubernetes application. We have here a deployment uh, file which is a description of uh, of deployments in Kubernetes, and you can see here the the values or the variables which is it's not good shown, but it's a uh, variables which were placed in pipeline and also there's a lot of other things of images here and uh, that's all uh, in general this looks fine for for or simple for uh, developers because you know uh, GitLab CI pipeline is on one one place and uh, the Kubernetes deployment files are in one place you can navigate uh, very easily on GitLab side. Okay. Can go here. Uh, this is the uh, entry page for uh, our group. And we can find a project, for example, customer customer service, which is our one of our microservice. Here is the uh, Git, Git uh, 
a repository where where all files are stored uh, issue tracker issue tracker <coughs> ci cd pipeline when i click on ci cd pipeline you can see here all the stages we we defined in uh, gitlab ci uh, file here is the build uh, release image and deploy to dev deploy to dev last time we run this it it uh, runs the the helm in installation and the common responsible for for installing is is here i can maybe bring right it's it's the same command and here is the re the result of our activity which is installing the service deployment and port how it looks like in uh, in a kubernetes cluster in a kubernetes cluster we can see maybe not now okay we can see that for for our NAND space, which was spending, there is a bunch of uh, microservices or uh, deployments uh, which uh, we installed from the pipeline. Each each uh, deployment has a separate project. So, so. what happened? Okay, so we can see that there is also pods which were, were installed directly from pipeline no manual action was done and also we can see that there is some services which uh, act as a load balancer for our pods and uh, we can check uh, swagger for one of our application through gateway that everything is running so that's 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 all from my side. If there is any question, you can you can ask now or you can join me after the session. Can you also call the rest API from GitHub CI? Yes, yes, you can. You can uh, do everything what you uh, can do in command line, for example, when you want to call any API, you just bring there some uh, image with curl or any tool which is uh, which can call this API. At the start of the presentation, you said that you are, you are going to present a uh, multi-shift mm -hmm. uh, Yes, this is the backend. Uh, there's the two parts of the application, front-end application it's written in Node.js. I can show you. Uh, okay, this is the front end. Uh, I got access to this uh, cluster a few days ago, so I don't have many time for it. But what it's going to be working is to log in into the system. So when I can log in the system, I go to to OAuth, some OAuth approval, authorized, and then it, it will go on the page. But uh, when I try to get some data from other microservices, it will crash because there is some some bug in our application. This application is used in, internally for for training, so maybe one of our colleague will fix this. But I don't I don't see any reason to do it now. So. Yes, all, all is all, all is done with uh, Docker images. So you act with to application in the same way. You only you, what you need is to create the Docker image for your application, put it on your Docker registry, and then you can install all you want. I stop it. Sorry, but if you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So now,
Ideme z tvojho, z môjho? Máš tam tú up-to-date prezentáciu, hej? Neviem, či nám to pomôže. Je to, funguje to na Windowsu? Máme, máme, máme. Funguje to s Windowsom? Tak skúsme. Je tam Keynote a PowerPoint. Dobre. Ale ide to. Hej, hej, hej. Dobre, to je tam. Jak sa dá vedieť, že je to up-to-date? Ej, či tam je tá vision. Ten vision slide. No to som to stvoril z oného. Hej, hej, hej. Poď úplne hore, tam čo to bolo. Tuto? Je to? Je tam. Dobre, tak to je up-to-date. Dobre. Z pravej strany to máš. Tá, dobrá. Čakám si na play. Výborné. Výborné. Hore. OK, everyone. Hello again and welcome to Ferratum. I would like to ask who has seen our previous presentation. Yes, a couple of guys. OK, so I'll just very quickly reiterate through some basic stuff. My name is David. This is my colleague, Janči. We are now called Technology Architecture Team, but we do DevOps stuff mostly, so it doesn't really matter. The time is quite late, so I'll go very quickly. So Ferratum is a fintech company. We have a couple of hundred employees worldwide, and IT is mostly here in Slovakia. About 150 people around here, and uh, uh, from those who you, uh, for those who uh, seen our previous presentation, you know that uh, we were transforming uh, our, our infrastructure from monolithic, uh, mostly Java-based on backend um, stack to something more modern. Uh, it started uh, beginning 2017. Uh, yeah, and uh, we were transforming transforming to uh, more microservice oriented, more flexible and more, more modern stack, still uh, with Java on backend and uh, PHP, Drupal, Node.js and many other technologies uh, around that. And uh, uh, one of our goals was to change the uh, delivery pipeline as well. Uh, historically, we are using uh, Bamboo, and Bamboo does, does not allow us uh, to do everything is in code as we would like. Uh, it, it's very nice from user perspective. It has nice uh, uh, graphical interface, but automation is not, not that easy. Uh, we tried. We tried CLI. We tried APIs. And, Right. Not, not, not really good. And uh, we really need that uh, automation around uh, deployments and builds because now we have uh, over, there was number 80 microservices, uh, but this is numbers uh, from November or October last year, so it, at least 15 or 20 more. Uh, so we really need to do some proper automation around that. And... Uh, uh, all these microservices are deployed to OpenShift cluster, and uh, we have lots of environments, lots of uh, requirements from uh, maintainers of those requirements, what can go where, et cetera. So uh, we wanted to build uh, some, some pipeline that would uh, suit our needs. And uh, what we wanted uh, to achieve uh, was to have everything as code, to have whole pipeline as code. Uh, to have it uh, auditable, uh, what happened where, who did the change, who deployed what to what environment, etc. 
due to the number of microservices, lots of them are basically the same. If you have Spring Boot application and we have like 50 of them, their build and deployment is the same. But in Bamboo, everyone created it manually. It looks differently for each of them. You cannot enforce some rules or it's very difficult. So we wanted to change that. Uh, we had uh, agreed on, on some branching model, but of course, each team deviates from that a little. Uh, everyone is using different versioning, and then you see like that snapshot in production, how that happened. So we wanted to avoid uh, situations like that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we built some immutable artifacts, Docker images, which travel through the whole uh, stack from development environment through several testing environments, pre-production and production. And no one can go around that and do some nasty stuff. And uh, I'd like to see that as well, visually. And we have lots of requirements from different teams uh, when people want to uh, manually say after some tests that artifact is okay to go to some environment and stuff like that. So these were some requirements uh, and uh, a vision that we wanted to implement uh, with our pipeline. Um, we decided to uh, move to Jenkins from Bamboo and implement this stuff uh, on Jenkins uh, using some, some, some scripts and, and tooling that we built around this. And uh, this presentation will be about that. So I'll uh, hand over the microphone to my colleague and uh, we'll go deeper into some more technical details and maybe to some at the end, perhaps. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, okay, our goals were uh, that uh, everything should be uh, code. Okay, and uh, we we had we have uh, had to start with installation. We decided to use uh, uh, Jenkins, but in a uh, uh, in a special uh, configuration, let's say, because it is not very usual to use it in. Uh, uh, some Kubernetes uh, or in our situation in uh, OpenShift environment. There is it is very, very good to, to have it there because uh, if you know the Jenkins, uh, for example, master doesn't have a high availability setup uh, to be active active. There is only the active passive mode. And uh, this OpenShift uh, installation is very helpful because uh, the OpenShift takes uh, takes care about the running ports, and if you have some kind of problem, uh, the pod is restarted. Okay, and uh, we choose uh, this uh, this type of setup, and there is very easily to to configure uh, such Docker files. Uh, Red Hat uh, supports uh, us uh, with. Uh, some base uh, images where is uh, uh, Jenkins installed in, in the master and slave uh, setup. We use the, them and somehow a uh, little bit customized, okay? And the configuration can be done for the Docker files, which is the basic and the uh, initial, initialization Groovy scripts, which can, uh, uh, which can uh, check the basic installation, okay? Uh, what we implement uh, further was uh, the Jenkins files, Groovy scripts, shell script, and Python. You can see later on some some details. Okay. What what features we have now? Okay, we have some robust infrastructure component, uh, which is uh, ma managed by uh, native uh, OpenShift uh, functionality. We have resources transfer and management. Uh, all, all those pods uh, must have uh, defined uh, 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 CPU and RAM com 
consumption uh, and uh, it is uh, also for the master and uh, also for agents or slave if you want to call them okay here is the automated uh, automated setup and configuration immutable builds environment separation because all builds are running uh, in uh, separated docker containers and what was the request from our boss was the encapsulation and separation code that we prepared uh, special templates for uh, oh, templates per technology for uh, for each technology we have se uh, separated templates for uh, builds and uh, deployment workflow is uh, managed by one common template okay uh, we will show uh, we will show you later uh, here here on the on the which is the, this one okay we can hear uh, tell oh okay or oh, later we will tell okay okay here is uh, mentioned uh, some CD workflow we will show you uh, which is uh, defined by our implementation of pipeline versioning enforcement and artifact deployments notification I will, I will show later some some details uh, it is not very meaningful to tell some something now okay here is the basic setup <laughs> in one very nice image we we have all our codes in in the bitbucket after some push uh, into any kind of uh, the branch the build is build runs and you you have all the stages uh, defined in our pipeline technically i will show you how it is uh, how it is defined in the jenkins files and groovy scripts later on okay uh, oh okay okay here is uh, <laughs> we can go very very fast through all the this we have de defined uh, special uh, the docker containers for the co container for the master are and uh, docker containers for each uh, agent type for building java we have a separate uh, container for building nodejs and uh, drupal and other php stuff we, we have different containers okay uh, resources transparent management uh, what i what i meant uh, by this uh okay uh it, it is a very very big advantage because you 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 can define uh, uh resources consumption by defining uh open shift uh, temp uh open shift deployment spec uh cpu and uh, memory uh all numbers or you can define directly all of them by defining agent configuration i will show you in in uh, examples and it is very good uh, when you define the numbers of parallel executors you have to very easily count uh, the resources which you need for your uh, cicd cluster when you decide to build up why we choose um, the Jenkins, yeah, it is quite old uh, stuff, but it is uh, quite uh, flexible. We have uh, here uh, uh, not only uh, Amazon Cloud, but we have uh, our private cloud that uh, therefore we decided to use the Jenkins for uh, CI CD implementation. Okay. Here are some some very short examples. How can you very easily set up uh, some configuration? The first part is from the Docker file. Second one is a uh, Groovy script, which uh, is uh, dedicated for. Oh yeah, this is the definition of parallel executors. That's that means how many parallel uh, agents can can run? Yeah, the number is ten. Okay, we wanted to decide, uh, yeah, that was what we wanted, uh, some kind of immutable builds. And uh, this, 
git integration environment separation in the docker containers which are running the builds can manage this immutable builds you can we have a trigger on the on the our uh, bit bucket which runs uh, all those builds and deployments uh, in in the jenkins in the uh, in the docker this is the Dockerize environment. Okay. Here are some examples of uh, encapsulations uh, of the code. Uh, yeah, I was, I was very surprised because we, we, we are on the stage of adaptions now, but for complete descri description of of our CD pipeline, you don't need to have so much code. And this code is shared by Jenkins shared libraries, which are written in Groovy. Yeah, and uh, you can write your own common task in order to optimize the, the number of code. You don't need to, to copy into each project uh, some kind of very huge uh, Jenkins file which define the builds, you can only the refer uh, some templates. I, I will show you later. Here is the here is the short example of how it looks like our uh, definition uh, Jenkins file for each developer. Yeah, the, you 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 have to define the template which you call, uh, define some notification emails. The, the emails which will be notified after success or unsuccessful builds. And here is the, the link to git. That's, that's all. That's uh, everything what the developer needs to put into the, uh, his own uh, git uh, repository root as a Jenkins file. And, uh, defi uh, and there is another point, you only uh, bit bucket uh, Jenkins plugin should be configured and everything works. I will show you later. Okay. <laughs> this is our simple, very, very, very high overview and simple uh, how it looks like our pipeline, which uh, has two main, main points. One is the build, which is one way and one time uh, task. And another one is the deployment pipeline, which is uh, in reality, some kind of uh, workflow that uh, after successful build is uh, started uh, deployment pipeline. And it looks like and in this way that we have defined uh, those four uh, environments. And after initialization, is a created pull request into the Bitbucket, into some configuration uh, repository. And after manual uh, merge, the deployment continues in the next stage. Yeah. yeah I, I, I described only one, one step here because uh, it is repeating uh, again and again. And the uh, uh, creating pull request started here uh, and uh, after successful deployment into uh, current uh, environment, the next uh, pull request into sit uh, configuration repository is created and so on and so on until the, until the, to the end. Okay, here is the part of my colleague. Uh, maybe maybe question. Do you want to see some some technical details, some code and and things around now or later on after after the presentation? It was very yeah. Okay. Okay, I can t uh, I can show you some technical details about. Windows. 
OK. Uh, OK. Uh, we prepared a full bar spring uh, application in order to, to use it in for some presentations, for, for some tests. Here you can see the uh, real Jenkins template, uh, real Jenkins file in the application root directory. Yeah. Sorry, I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except at all. Okay. Here are some some comments, and here is exactly the the same what I put into the presentation. Okay, this is the the everything what is important from a developer's point of view, only to know know the the Maven uh, Jenkins uh, template. Okay, and yeah, this is the this is documented in our confluence. Uh, that it is very pretty easy. And when when you put it there and de define or uh, configure Bitbucket uh, plugin, everything automatically works on the Jenkins side. I can show you uh, the UI. Uh, okay, here is the dashboard. And uh, the Fubar Spring is uh, into DevOps, I think. Yeah, here, here you can you can see the structure. Uh, when you, when you go in, inside, you can see all all branches. And when you when you go into one of them, for example, for example, uh, here is the develop. You can see the the result of the build. So now, now the question is where does all this stuff come from if the Jenkins file has like five lines, right? Okay, I can I can show you here. Uh, we have uh, yeah separated uh, templates for yeah it is called it is uh, it is written in the main yeah, there are Jenkins file. The main concept uh, is inherited from, from the Groovy, extended with some specific syntax. It is very easy. Okay, and you can hear some, some, some real stages. We have, for example, here in the build uh, and test stage, we have all three, three commands, clean, compile, test verify, verify, sonar, sonar. And for example, here is the artifact uh, package. There is uh, the uh, Java package and the Docker build. And here is the artifact push into the, the Maven, uh, into the Nexus repository, and here is into the Docker. After after uh, success, uh, the continuous process continues, and uh, the deployment pipelines is is uh, called. Yeah. Uh, the point of this is, as I mentioned, we have a big amount of microservices. Most of them are very sim have very similar build steps. So we agreed with the developers. What would be the standard build steps for uh, Spring? My vision was uh, to to describe the pipeline in a couple of steps and. Uh, let's the pipeline or the tooling around the pipeline decide which steps 
are run in which situations. So that, that's the topic that was uh, that we skipped for for a while. It ties to versioning and and uh, branching model. So we have some custom pipeline logic which decides uh, based on uh, what branch uh, the pipeline is running on, what version uh, you have specified for the application, which steps uh, of the pipelines of the pipeline are run. Uh, so that's why the uh, pipeline file can be quite simple because it just lists the steps like build, test, package, deploy, etc. And there is no obvious logic how it would happen. Uh, it looks like the deploy would happen all the time, but it's not true because the pipeline will check that, okay, I'm on feature branch, so I will not run the deploy step. Uh, yeah, Yanchi, if you can go higher. You can see this, this is this is the tooling that's, that makes sure that I want to run this command and it's a push phase of the pipeline and the pipeline will decide that if on current branch and current version, the push is applicable. Because I don't want to push from, from uh, JAR to Nexus from, for, from feature branch. OK. This Definitions and then many times I ended up with copy paste of 10 lines of, of the pipeline steps for this branch with this same, same, same. Okay, on this branch, let's skip this one. And then you want to change something and you have to manage it like this. Okay. And the... That, 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 that's that's the tooling. That's the tool that uh, it's a uh, it's a Python based uh, tool, but yeah, some custom. It will basically take uh, as input the, uh, the current stage we are on, branch name, version name. Is it validate them? So Python will immediately fail if you run from from branch, some my custom branch. So we have strict definition of, of a branching model uh, as per uh, Git flow. You run pipeline from other branch, it will not run. We have defined versioning for the applications that uh, should be used across the whole company. If you create some version that doesn't match sem semantic versioning, the pipeline will fail because I cannot decide if I can deploy uh, test snapshots release something custom because people are very creative and creating versions <laughs> so we have made sure that uh, this never happens uh, when i want to deploy to to a test environment uh, it can be done only from a release branch and it has to be at least release candidate i don't want to see build snapshots in test environment if i want to go to production it must be uh, as per Git flow from master with proper tag. You don't follow Git flow, you don't tag it, you, it doesn't get deployed. And it has to be a release. We, we won't see anything uh, else in production, just release. And uh, since developers just include the whole template, there is basically no way around it. They would have to write the whole pipeline themselves. They, they could do it. Jenkins will pick it up. It will pick any uh, Jenkins file automatically. But they would have to know uh, what environments or variables are used for uh, uh, for authentication and, and stuff like that. Uh, of course, it could be done. Someone could go uh, around the system. It would be very difficult for them. It wouldn't make sense. But it would be, again, in, in uh, their repository. So I can run a simple scanner to check who is not using my, our template for building. And this way we have very unified pipeline uh, across the company. And versioning and branching. And then you can do monitoring on it and 
lots of lots of stuff. The whole DevOps toolkit thing, like having the dashboard, seeing what's where, when, is suddenly much more easier if you don't have to parse some custom versions developers have come up with. You already explained yeah. all Yeah, yeah, explained five more. Okay, go on. Okay. Uh, the part of uh, our presentation should be talk, talk about some insights of technology stuff in in the jenkins there are a few there are, huh, let's say a uh, few possibilities which you can use you can you can use it in, in that way which we define it for example for those built uh, templates on the end we are we are calling uh, this uh, uh, deployment workflow yeah and this is defined uh, completely di different <laughs> different way okay and we are using the jenkins uh, common libraries or shared libraries <coughs> stuff and you can def define your own jenkins tasks okay? uh, yeah for example i can i can show you oh this is the complete our deployment uh pipeline implemented in uh, as our uh, separate task which is called fa deploy service okay let me close it and here you can see that we call exactly oh no no no, no. this is uh, included uh, in, a, in another jenkins file oh, okay sorry for Maybe a bit misunderstanding, but uh, I will show you again. Okay, here is the the complete deployment uh, workflow, which is defined in in different way. Okay, this is the task, and here are the possibilities to call some separate functions. For example, from this task, you can you can see that we are using such a language specific thing and it is uh, some static uh, class and stat static methods there are many many things how, how can you how can you write your own uh, code it, it depends on your preferences maybe maybe some additional details i can i can tell you later in after 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 meetup yeah here i can i can show you some for example some uh customized containers if you are interested in what uh, maybe maybe the question is can you <laughs> can you ask me some some details i will explain in, in I can I can show you some example if you want to see. Uh, yes, at, at, I can, the, at the end of the build, you can show me at the end of the build there is a trigger of a deployment pipeline. So the build pipeline ends, and it will create the instance of a new uh, pipeline, which is it was the definition of several uh, environments. Yeah. Uh, we have logic somewhere. And yeah, it, it is here. The calling of the deployment pipeline is here, exact. Yeah, that we call the deployment pipeline, and uh, the stuff you can see here. Okay, so here is some kind of uh, initialization part, and you have now you have defined uh, uh, all dev, all other stages. Yeah, here is the dev SIT environment with some parameterization and. Uh, Complete CD pipeline starts with the, here with the initialization. Uh, can you show the part where uh, 
if a pipeline asks what environments are valid. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, with, with the branches and releases, what we do, we have defined what version can go into what environment. We have that as a configuration in code, so I can, we can change it quite easily. And the pipeline will dynamically ask for each deployment that when uh, uh, an artifact goes through the deployment pipeline, what target environments are uh, valid for given artifact. So if it's a, a build snapshot artifact, uh, the result will be probably only dev at the moment, but we already have three dev environments. So I don't have to change pipeline. I just change the configuration so for build snapshots, deploy to dev one, dev two, dev three. And the pipeline will take that information and uh, apply it to, to the artifact. So it will deploy to all, uh, all environments. And I create a, a release. The pipeline will ask, where can I go with the release? And it will mean probably several pre-production environments as well. So it's again, a dynamic information which can be managed as configuration in code. I can, I can show you the process in a running example if you want to see it. Okay. Here is the full bar developed branch. Uh, I will update uh, some dummy timestamp in order to have uh, the push into the developed branch at the origin. Okay, and here you can see the Uh, yeah, it is it is full bar spring uh, developed branch. The push was recognized and uh, the build is started. Yeah, th th this this stage takes some some minutes. Okay, you can go back to to the code. Okay, here is the initialization of the of the next uh, deployment pipeline, and ha here you can you can see the calling of some validation sta stages validation i have some additional logic which tells you that oh, okay if it is uh, built snapshot and so on so on. maybe maybe it will take some time sorry okay here is you can see all those build stages that the first now we have build and test stage i i will go back to the template okay and we have now here those three commands clean compile test verify and then sonar okay here here you can you can see some some graphical uh, output from the Test results, some recorded artifacts from previous builds or from the last successful build. I don't know whether you know um, the UI. It is um, a little bit Spartan UI, but you have here all the necessary information which you need. <coughs> Jenkins, uh, guys, uh, released uh, much, much nicer. UI, but uh, it is not so good functional as, as this one. Okay, the build phase was successful, and now we can check that the the result of the build in our environment is always a Docker image. Even if we push some jar to Nexus, it's basically not used except some special cases when we build some internal libraries. So we build a Docker image and that's immutable and it goes through all environments it, it never changes okay and here you can see the the deployment process which started of the fubar this is completely different pipeline at the end of the build pipeline it created new instance of the deployment pipeline okay we went through the 
initial uh, validation part. And I guess that the pull request in our <coughs> bit bucket is already created. Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, to explain this repository for those who didn't see our previous presentation, uh, we manage all our configuration uh, outside of the uh, application repositories. We have special repositories for each of the environment uh, where we manage all configuration for all applications. Uh, this configuration is then distributed to the applications through a config server from a Spring uh, environment. And uh, uh, the config server uses uh, Bitbucket as its backend uh, to collide the configuration. Uh, we decided that uh, uh, deployment should be part of the configuration because it means that in our configuration we actually describe the actual state of our cluster of all applications. So we can restore the whole cluster from the configuration of the cluster. Uh, and uh, if you, Janch, if you can show uh, the, the contents, diff. The uh, deployment pipeline uh, created something like this, which is we call deployment descriptor, which tells the deployment pipeline what application, in what version, what image uh, should be deployed uh, to the cluster. It will generate such file uh, for each of the environments as we go uh, through the pipeline. Uh, for now, this is uh, this is not merged automatically, uh, so we can also show it to you. So you can see that the pipeline stopped, and it's waiting for for merge uh, of this pull request. For in dev environment, normally it would be merged automatically. We don't want developers to have to wait. To, to do this, it would just happen automatically. But it would still raise a pull request and and merge it uh, afterwards. Yeah. So since uh, this uh, repository uh, contains uh, uh, other stuff than than deployments, it contains the configurations. We have some uh, validation. Uh, pipeline, so it has to run first. Uh, so maybe we can open uh, in Jenkins the uh, uh, config, so we can we can see the state. It's in a config uh, project. Okay, obviously there are some issues with the cleanup. Uh, foobar, uh, there we go, foobar, foobar. Foobar, oh, it's done already. Okay, we should be able to merge now. No, can you refresh? Demo effect, no, yes, no, Ooh, okay. Check it, check, yes. If someone knows a heck how to enforce that checkbox in Bitbucket, I would be so, so grateful. There is no API for it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Out of the box thinking, yes. Okay, so uh, uh, as we merged this pull request, the cloud, the, the configs pipeline will run again, and it will find that uh, there was some. Hmm? Yep, no, but first, if if you if you go back to the config, uh, uh, config one, because it was it has to find what application wants to be deployed. So it will do some parsing on Git log and find that there was a deploy file and this application in this version with this build number would like to get deployed and it will make sure that the, the uh, deployment pipeline for the application will now continue. Okay. 
So, for example, uh, for our SIT environments, uh, the SIT guys control uh, what can be deployed uh, when into their environment so it doesn't disrupt uh, if they're running some tests. So developers will just create a new release. It will raise uh, the pull request. And when SIT guys are ready, they'll just merge the pull request and get whatever they need. So they will control when it gets deployed. OK. And uh, we can show uh, OpenShift now. So we, we, see, we can see that uh, the deployment actually happened. It's in infra, yeah? so we can already see that there is a rolling update in progress. <laughs> Any questions for this? Uh, how the application will be built? Deployed. No. no, because the microservice is just a Docker image with some configuration, which is in, in the uh, config server, and some environment variables which are automatically injected in, in OpenShift. So it's very deployment. There is, uh, after this change, uh, before this change, there were custom deployment manuals. This needs to be copied there and you know, all these procedures, not anymore. There is no need for anyone handling the deployments at all. Once the developers create the image, it just travels through the environment. The only thing that has to be taken care of, that if you do a change in a configuration, you have to make sure that is uh, the change in the configuration is uh, in all environments once the uh, artifact gets to, to given environment, which can be sometimes challenging if there is, I don't know, a couple of days or weeks between creation of the artifact and uh, uh, and deployment to production, for example. And it, it could be forgotten. We have played with idea of versioning uh, of the configurations themselves. And it's tricky because we have a chicken egg issue. I want to change the configuration, so I change my application that I will be using this configuration. But then I have to write into configuration that in this environment there is a new version of the application. So then you have a loop. So it doesn't work really well. Uh, so this is this is one of the issues. If if you guys have solved this, because for example in, in current setup. Uh, if you you don't want to forget to do the configuration changes in production, so you go ahead and prepare the new configuration, even if uh, uh, the artifact is not ready yet. But if the configuration is uh, some critical change, and uh, a pod dies, and OpenShift will spin up the old version, still the old version of the pod, but it will take the new configuration. So it's not the best scenario just to have one configuration, but having them versioned is not not solution as well. So this is something I haven't found solution for yet. Uh, uh, yes, but it's a no-go because you are tagging a specific commit and each application would need a different tag. But the config server doesn't work like that. The config server, you, you could tell config server that serve this tag of the whole repository, but each application would need a different tag. So that's a no go. So you'd have, you would have to have a configuration repository for each application and then tag them. Then yes, it would work. And yes, you could have uh, multiple Git backends for the config server, but you would have to have n plus n number of repositories times the number of environments. Because for security reasons, you, we cannot have like environments in branches because if there are some sensitive stuff or stuff like that. So we, we have separate uh, repositories for each environment with configuration and for production, only certain people see, see that. Thank you. 
But it's, it doesn't change the situation. It doesn't matter if I take the configuration from the uh, config map or from the config server. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll have to check that. Okay. And where is the where is the source of uh, the config map, or is it? Okay, but if, if if you change the uh, Git repository in the meantime, it's will it still will take the old one? We are not there in the configuration, but our plan is to start a new format for the microservices. Okay. Okay, we'll check that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, any other questions? No. Uh, usually the tech lead will handle the release management. So tech lead, let's say tech lead just released something. The previous ver version was 1.3 dot release because it was released. And if you go follow git flow and you finish release or git flow finish release, it will merge into master, it will, it will merge into develop. And the first thing that uh, the tech lead will do is to bump version in develop. Well, I, I said 1.3. 1.4 dot build snapshot. So all your feature branches are now 1.4 build snapshot. Uh, the feature branches don't get deployed, don't get pushed anywhere. Uh, you just run all the tests uh, on, on feature branches. When you merge the feature branch, it's always 1.4 uh, build snapshot. And, uh, and uh, uh, it will get deployed to dev environment automatically. Then when, when uh, we want to release, we create release branch. Uh, we create RC version. So I would get 1.4.0.rc1, uh, tag it, push it to the pipeline, and it will get deployed to SIT once the pull request for deployment is merged. Uh, QA gives it back. So we have RC155. Not really, uh, and uh, you are happy with it. So uh, again, usually tech lead or some senior member of the team uh, will do Git flow finish release, merge it to the master uh, with version one dot point four zero dot release, and uh, run it through the pipeline, and uh, it will get deployed to pre production if we simplify it, and then product to production. Uh, uh, we version uh, the API. That's another thing why we stick to the strict versioning. Uh, we version APIs as well. We don't need the release stuff and so on. Just just the numbers, just semantic versioning. And uh, what we do, we have uh, API definitions. Uh, where did I have it? No. No, this is what we had before. This one gets me home. Awesome. What the fuck is that? Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, so we have API, uh, APIs in Swagger Hub, uh, the definition for the REST APIs. They are versioned the same way. Uh, we have a small tool uh, which will take the, the uh, some meta information from your project. Until now, it was very simple. Uh, application uh, version 1.4 implemented API version 1.4. Uh, we have now run into issues. We need to implement more ver APIs and the versioning got, got tricky. Uh, so we have some meta file which defines uh, what APIs is uh, uh, application implementing. And uh, in the pipeline, we enforce that there is a, a tool which will check uh, the actual implementation of the API against the versions in, in the Swagger Hub. So again, the versioning, the clear versioning is very hand, helpful in that as well. Thank you. 
Uh, well, if you run tests, it will actually speed up the Spring application. And uh, there are some integration tests that guys implement, some some sanity, some smoke tests that I can, I can connect to config server. That's the first thing. You have to be able to connect to config server. Uh, the application YAML file we have in, in config server. So all spe uh, environment specific uh, configuration is extracted to uh, to the cloud, cloud configs. So if you cannot get to config server, your application won't even start because it won't have half of the uh, configuration. Uh, we are currently implementing something like that. I don't know if you mean some specific tool or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried that. Uh, is it bound to to Eureka or some discovery service? No, no, this is, is uh, on the level of uh, JMU integration. Ah, okay. Okay, cool. Uh, it's, it's, uh, agnostic to the API. Mm -hmm. Cool, good to know, good tip. Anything else? No? If no, then thank you very much for the attention and your questions. And uh, we are very happy to be to have you here and host you. And uh, see you next time. <laughs>